demonstration. If you want to join me, you're welcome to. We can do it together. <laughs> Sit down. Um... Well, good evening and welcome everyone uh, to this retreat on the Four Noble Truth. Um, is there anyone who has never heard of the Four Noble Truth? Can you raise your hands if you have never received a teaching on the Four Noble Truth? Yes, please raise your hands. Yes, okay, good, very good. All right. Um, so anyone totally new to Buddhism? Okay, okay, great. It's just good to know. So, well, as you know, the teaching on what are called the Four Noble Truth. Um, and actually, those are the most important teachings of the Buddha. I would say everything, not, not just me would say so. I mean, it's usually explained that all the teachings the Buddha gave 
all the Buddhist teachings can be included in the Four Noble Truths. So you're pretty safe learning that. If you want to know about Buddhism, you're safe learning about the Four Noble Truths. Now, I taught this before um, in a context which I'll sp speak about in a moment. There's a certain topic of study that is traditionally done in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition or in the Buddhist, uh, yeah, in Tibetan Buddhism. So in that context, I taught this before in Dharamsala. And then the material I used at that time, I'll just put it together. So this is the little booklet you have. Now, it's become a lot. How many pages? Oh, oh my God. It's, I, 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 my pages were different. I had only 68 pages, but this is much more. Um, of course, it's unrealistic for me to read all this. Uh, you should do this at your own time. I will cite from this. I will go according to this book. Uh, but if you have the time, in the meantime, when you're at home, it's, it's helpful if you read this. If you have questions, uh, you can come and ask those in class. So you're well prepared then. At least, you know, you know what we're going to talk about. And it's always helpful to read in advance. Like this is the way I was taught, the way I was educated in Buddhist philosophy. I would always read in advance and it makes a huge difference. Just even just reading it, being distracted, you still get some benefit. You just understand more whatever has been uh, taught in, in this particular class here. Also, what I would like to request you is to be 100% Israeli. <laughs> <laughs> to be straightforward. If you don't like something, if you don't agree with something, to always say so. So you don't agree? Well, there's time, of course, in class. Or there's time, I mean, to always debate, in other words. So at any point you disagree with, write it down and then voice your, your disagreement. If something doesn't make sense, anything is welcome. I, in fact, I would, like to, I would like to request you any question, any doubt, anything that you find annoying or, you know, whatever kind of comes up to share it with the group, right? So in that way, everyone else may have the same sentiment, may have the same question, so everyone benefits from it. Um, and it just gives me a better sense where you're at, uh, what you're struggling with, and then we can address it, because of course, this subject is so vast. And the idea is that one should really digest it, to really go through it. So the more you have that sense, like, I find some fold in this, there's just something wrong with it. The more your mind is active, the more your mind is kind of has that analytical, investigative kind of factor going, and that is very beneficial for getting a good understanding. So I would like you to do that, to be always skeptical and always have in the back of your mind, no, that can't be right, that can't be right, right? And see whether there is something that would contradict, in, in particular with regard to your own experience, something that is contradictory in here. So always have that in the back of your mind. We were trained in that way. So it's, it's not seen as something disrespectful or something. No, it's the opposite. It's seen as the best way uh, to get the most out of these teachings, to have that critical, skeptical, kind of analytical mind going at all times. So that's one thing I'd like you to, to do during this time here. But another thing I would like you to do is to try and apply it to yourself. Whatever you hear, don't apply it to your neighbor or, you know, to the guy next, I don't know, sitting next to you or your mom or your dad. No, no, your own experience. Does that make sense? Whatever we speak about, does this make sense with regard to your own experience? Does this ring true or not? And again, have that skepticism, have that kind of in the back of your mind, oh, maybe that doesn't make sense. So in that way, I believe you get most out of it because this is the material we study, the Tibetan word study and the English word study don't really have the same connotation. Oftentimes in English, study seems to mean just gaining more information. For some people, like academic study, like you, you get a full understanding, you can maybe cite it back, you can teach someone else. Where study in the Buddhist context, in the Tibetan language, in the Buddhist context in particular, means to, yes, gain understanding, new knowledge, new information, but to apply it to yourself. 
to apply it to yourself, to see whether this makes sense with regard to your own experience. So it's not just some like kind of knowledge over there, but it's knowledge right here. Yeah? And it's not about gaining facts, like you'll be able to cite back whatever's been taught here. It's not about that. If you focus on just that, you don't get as much out of it. So what I would like you to do is like to, well, kind of a new agey way of saying is take it to the heart, right? So to try and take it to the heart and not just have it on an intellectual basis, okay? All right. So in that way also those who already know the Four Noble Truths get something else out of it. So with regard to the Four Noble Truths, one of the main teachings of the Buddha, so if you live in Dharamsala, for example, His Holiness the Dalai Lama teaches this frequently. And so many monks and nuns who've had these, who've received these teachings thousands of times come again and again and again. Now, of course, it has to do with the person teaching. <coughs> with regard to His Holiness, of course, people want to be close to His Holiness and there's a special blessing being around Him. But there's another reason that every time you listen to the same teaching, you get something different. Because since you heard it for the first time, You've changed. Of course, we change all the time. So you're not the same person any longer that you were when you received these teachings for the first time. And just depending on your day, on what you've gone through, it affects you very differently. And every time there's a different experience. But you need to allow this to happen, to, to allow it to sink to this level so that, let it not, so that it doesn't just stay in the head, but goes to a deeper kind of more emotional level. So this kind of emotional level, why am I talking about an emotional level? Studying on an emotional level. So really in, 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 in Tibetan, there's not that explanation. There's not really that difference between what we do in the West. We talk about the head and the heart, right? So Tibetans don't use the same words, but it, it works just as well. It's just a different kind of vocabulary they may use, a different way of describing it. But there is, from my own experience and, you know, having been raised, well, in the West and so forth, there's definitely that difference. And anywhere, for any human being, there's the difference between what we intellectually un understand and what we d feel deep within. Okay? So there are lots of examples, lots of examples where intellectually we know one thing, but emotionally it's different. There's a huge gap sometimes. The classic example, of course, is we know we're going to die one day, right? Intellectually, if you were going to ask me, are you going to die one day? I don't even take a second to think about it. I'll just tell you, yes, of course I will. But I live my life as if I'm going to live forever, right? Oh, I'm not going to die tomorrow. If, so, if you were to ask me, are you going to die? Is there a possibility you die tomorrow? I say, sure, there's a possibility. But deep within, no, I'm too busy to die tomorrow. No, I have no time to die tomorrow. <laughs> too many plants. So it's like, I, emotionally, it doesn't feel that way. Intellectually, maybe. Right? So what governs my actions? Not what's up here. What I feel emotionally about, you know, what's going to come tomorrow and so forth. So can you see the difference? Does that make sense? Another example I, I really like is the example of where there's a saying in English, Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. Okay, so if you give me that saying, I would go, yes, yes, that makes total sense. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And then if you don't like the same thing that I like, I go, what a weird taste! You don't like this? Come on, it's so pretty. You're so weird, right? This is a sense like someone else likes something totally different. It's like, what a weird person. It's so obviously beautiful. So there's this sense, like, there's this objective beauty over there, <coughs> and we act accordingly. So anyway, those are just a few examples where there's a discrepancy between how we feel and how we intellectually think. And what I would like you to do during this retreat is to not have that so much working, but the, the emotional, if you can. Okay? So it is through the intellectual, of course, we need to understand some of the information, but also to bring it more to the level of the heart if that kind of makes sense, yeah? Okay, now when I started putting this material together, like I, s I mentioned this briefly a few minutes ago, the idea that when you study this in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, 
which of course originated in India, uh, sometimes referred to the Mahayana tradition or also universal vehicle tradition, or as His Holiness the Dalai Lama frequently calls it, the Nalanda tradition. So the Nalanda tradition of Buddhism, Nalanda is just the name of a great monastic university that existed in India. And many of the great masters uh, whose texts, whose teachings we still study, they originated from that particular monastic university called Nalanda. Not to be confused with the one in France now. <laughs> it's just got the same name. Anyway, so within this Nalanda tradition, um, they, there was a a way to study some of the more important texts. So uh, basically the Nalanda tradition, they took a particular genre of the Buddha's teachings. So usually um, a way to, and this is what's mentioned in the first pages here, in the first few pages uh, it talks about uh, just an introductory kind of uh, easing you into the material. So I won't read through it, uh, but I'll speak about it a little bit so you understand how traditionally the Four Noble Truths are part of the, the tradition, of the, of, the, sorry, of the study of philosophy in the kind of, especially in the Tibetan uh, system now, in the Gelugpa Tibetan system, I should specify. Okay, so... Um, and again, can, this can be traced back, of course, to the Nalanda Monastery, the Nalanda Monastic Institution or Monastic University of India. Well, basically what happened was when the Buddha was around, when the Buddha taught, he didn't teach in a way that is very helpful if you try to categorize the Buddha's teachings. So it was not like the Buddha taught in a way like, okay, so yesterday I spoke about such and such, today I'm going to talk about this, and then tomorrow we continue like that. It wasn't like that at all. Rather, the Buddha, when he taught, he met people. He, he wandered around India, he, he walked around India, he traveled around India, um, and whoever he encountered, according to this person's needs, predisposition, aspiration, and so forth, the Buddha gave spontaneously a teaching. And then he would meet someone else. Sometimes his disciples, he had tr disciples traveling with him, someone would ask a question. And then a kind of di discussion, debate uh, came forth. And sometimes it is explained that it was through the blessings of the Buddha that the response that was given by one of the disciples was also a teaching that the Buddha gave. It was through the, the blessing of the Buddha that this person gave a particular teaching. But often enough, it was like the Buddha himself would respond to a question and a discussion came forth. And basically, he taught on the spot what was most appropriate to a particular person. And that went on for about 45 years. Now then, after the Buddha had passed away, there was this huge body of teachings that people could remember. People had the ability at that time due to uh, very profound uh, techniques, very... Um, special types of techniques, they had uh, developed the ability to remember everything that was said, uh, or at least the majority of what had been said. They had generate, uh, developed what's called nowadays photographic memory, and thereafter it was all written down and it was categorized. The teachings of the Buddha were categorized. So the different ways of categorizing this huge body of teachings, and one way is to categorize the teachings into what are called the three wheels. And then you hear the three wheels. Well, there's different ways of categorizing it into the three wheels. Um, but the way here, the most, forward, uh, most straightforward way uh, I chose here is to just uh, divide the, the period of the Buddha's teachings, like this 45 years, into three main periods. And then talk about the first wheel, which was during the first period, then the, the middling or the second wheel, which was more towards the well, like when the Buddha was 57, 60, you know, around that age. So that was the, the second wheel. And then more towards the end of his life, when he was in his 70s, 80s, uh, that's the third wheel of Dharma. So for the sake of this, this, this course we do here, or this uh, retreat, this should suffice. Okay. And of those three wheels, it is seen, the second wheel is seen as the most important, the perfection of wisdom sutras. Now, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, 
They were taught in a way in which there was an explicit explanation of the ultimate view of reality. So how phenomena actually exist. What is reality? Uh, so that was one part of the teachings that were given explicitly. They were explicit by way of just reading through it. From the words you could understand, oh, here the Buddha talks about how phenomena really exist. But then implied, and this is also what people understood by reading this text, implied was how to meditate, how to train the mind, what to do with the ultimate with that reality that the Buddha explained explicitly, how to Think about this, how to meditate on this, and how to thereby transform the mind and overcome problems, difficulties, and so forth. So that was implied in those Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. All right. So I'm not going to talk about the first or the third wheel. The first wheel, of course, speaks about the Four Noble Truths, for example. So right now, I'll mention those later, but right now, no need to talk about the first wheel. And in the introduction, it gives you some explanation. So if you read on your own what the first wheel uh, entails, what the last wheel entails. But the second wheel uh, referred to those two aspects. So the explicit explanation, reality, what is reality, the ultimate reality of phenomena, and the implicit meaning, how to meditate, what are the different paths, what are the techniques to transform the mind and become liberated or enlightened. Now, with regard to the explicit meaning, a person called Nagarjuna dealt with that. So Nagarjuna, a great Indian master, he took the explicit meaning of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras and explained them by way of composing six different texts. They're also mentioned in here. But then uh, someone else came along, uh, well, came along as in like, was one of the, the uh, followers of the Buddha called Maitreya. He gave a teaching uh, or an explanation on the implicit meaning of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. So what was implicitly taught in them, he gave an explanation of that. And it was, it was, uh, well, it was a teaching he gave to one of his disciples called Asanga. And Asanga wrote down these teachings and there became a book called The Ornament for Clear Realizations. Now this text we studied traditionally in the monastic institutions. This text, The Ornament for Clear Realization by Maitreya, which basically explains the path, the techniques, the ways to transform the mind, how to go about step by step uh, changing the mind, what to meditate on, what to think about, and so forth, in order to transform the mind and remove problems. And we'll speak about this, of course, what that actually means. So this text, uh, called The Ornament for Clear Realizations, uh, is traditionally studied, is written in verse, so it's not that, that long. It's basically, it's not an explanation as much as just different points, a summary of different points that are very eloquently kind of mentioned in those different verses. And those are the different points one studies. Okay, so different path, different techniques, uh, different things that one goes through. So as part of this study, so this text, uh, this particular text has eight chapters. Eight chapters. And then each chapter uh, deals with a particular, what is called a path, a consciousness, a particular consciousness that takes one closer to liberation or enlightenment. Okay. And then each of these chapters, dealing with one particular path consciousness, with one particular path, has subtopics. So subtopics, for example, i just give you the example of the first chapter. It has actually ten topics. But the main topic is one particular path, which is the omniscient mind of a Buddha. A particular consciousness here called the omniscient mind of a Buddha. It's a path consciousness. Um, so the, the omniscient mind of the Buddha, and there are ten subtopics which characterize the omniscient mind of a Buddha. Okay? So the first thing you learn about when you study this text, what is a Buddha? Omniscient mind of a Buddha. Okay, so that's kind of like the goal, in particular in the Mahayana or universal vehicle tradition, the goal is to become a Buddha, which anyone can become a Buddha, so it's considered to be totally possible for anyone, but only if one 
kind of goes through the correct steps and as an inspiration basically here in the first chapter right away you present it with a result um, trying to think it's a bit like if you want to renovate your house and as a part of the advertisement there's like this fully renovated house on the first page right oh this is what it's going to look like oh that's pretty that's pretty beautiful so the first on the first page you get an advertisement of that beautiful house, you know, like you get these people to do it for you. And there's someone with a computer, they, they put this model of this beautifully, this is your new house. Wow, now you're really inspired to pay all the money, to make all the effort, to have this dusty house for I don't know how long until they're done with the work. So it's a bit similar, okay? So you, you, you learn about the Buddha's mind. Oh, how inspiring. I can be like that. So you learn how this is possible, you yourself can become like that, and in that process you're inspired and you want to do it, and you start learning the, the remaining chapters, the remaining seven chapters of the text, well, because, you know, this is what you're aiming for now. So it's a bit like skillful Buddhist enter, uh, advertising, <laughs> right? Okay, anyway, or a particular type of, yeah, Buddhist ex advertising, anyway. But... Going back to this text, so there are different topics, as I just said, 10 topics in the first chapter, which basically deals with one of the path consciousnesses, but by way of explaining 10 topics. And then each chapter, there are a certain amount of topics, so that in the end you end up with 70 topics, eight chapters with 70 different topics. Okay, so you learn these 70 topics traditionally in the Tibetan tradition over six years, right? Yeah. So some of these topics, and as part of this uh, of my visit here in Israel, um, since I had the opportunity to learn about these topics, to debate them and learn in, in the traditional way, in a way in which this has been done now for more than a thousand years in Tibet now, or in the Tibetan tradition, uh, I decided to, to teach the same. Might as well. I did teach. I, I was taught the same in, in detail. I had the opportunity to study this, so I decided I just go through these topics. Okay. So this is why you find an explanation. I don't need to read through these verses here, but there's there are two verses um, on page three that you can see that basically describe the first chapter, the first chapter, and the ten subtopics of the first chapter. Like I said, the omniscient mind of the Buddha is the path consciousness that is mainly taught in the first chapter and the way it is taught is by way of teaching 10 subtopics okay 10 topics all right and those 10 topics are then cited on page 4 bodhicitta is the first topic uh, then there are something called mayana practice instructions uh, the fourfold branches of the definite distinction which means the path of preparation anyway um, for those of you who have some background in Buddhism, this may be helpful to read what it says on page 4 and page 5, but not necessary really for this course. All I'm saying here is that we've done bodhicitta before as part of this philosophy class. I taught the topic of bodhicitta uh, during a course like this with materials similar like this available. And then, so bodhicitta being the mind that wishes to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. But then the idea is just wishing for it is not enough. So one needs to practice. So what, what is it that one needs to practice? Well, there are the practice instructions, the Mayana practice instructions given by the Buddha. And following those, according to the instructions, step by step, graduated steps that need to be followed, then one is able to become a Buddha oneself. Okay? And then from there, it continues on, these other topics. Uh, you can read through it at your own time. But the Mayana practice instructions, this particular topic, again, consists of 10 subtopics. Now, if I said it was only seven topics, it, when I said previously, this entire text, the Ornament uh, for Clear Realizations, uh, teaches 70 topics. I, 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 wasn't th I was not saying it's only 70 topics. It's because over seven years, six, seven years studying this topic, of course, there are a lot of topics that come up. So some of those 70 topics have other subtopics. Okay. So then if you see on page six, it talks about now the second 
topic of the seven T topics is the minor practice instructions, and that can be further divided into those 10 topics. So the first topic of those 10 subtopics of the minor practice instructions are the two truths. This we also did before, we did last year. So bodhicitta we did two years ago, and the two truths we did last year. So in the same way, as I studied it, I presented it here, of course, in a very abbreviated version, but nonetheless, uh, I believe uh, the kind of most